Here we are again, Yay. and I am excited about our topic today. I'm not sure where the conversation's going to go, but I think it's super relevant to to where a lot of us are today. So and are you, you ready? Yes, but you noticed this morning we were running. I tried to see if I could get a little preview on the topic, yeah. and you gave me nothing. That's so. the rule, right? <laughs> like we bring it to the table that day. Okay, here we go. Sally will be 12 this year. And in our household, the rule is when you are 12, you get a cell phone. That is the year of the cell phone. That started many years ago. That was when McKenna got her first one at a recommendation from my sister-in-law's. And that's been a very good piece of advice that I appreciated that seemed to be a good age for my kids. And it was 12. Well, we both have kids that are older, and mm -hmm. now we have a second wave of kids mm -hmm. that are coming through where things have changed a little bit yes. since our, for our older kids who are now in college and later years in high school started with the cell phone. So today I wanted to have a conversation around children and technology and the rules that we have for that because in this society it seems like today everybody wants to put people in a box one extreme to the other mm -hmm. and I know that once I was told when McKenna and Kelsey were younger one of the rules we had around their phones uh, somebody referred to me as a helicopter mom and I thought, why do you have to put a label on that? Which is one of like the most extreme labels. In, and then other people would talk about people and be like, she's so irresponsible. And I thought, why are you putting that label on her? And so drop the labels and just have a conversation around technology and kids and rules. Yeah, and I love when we have conversations. It's been a long time since I've had a conversation about technology due to the fact that, like you mm -hmm. said, the older kids had their thing, and so, but we're going to be back there too. So 12 is also yeah. the age in my household okay. that all of my children have received a cell phone. So I am, I, and that has been a great choice. Mm -hmm. They always spend that very last year, I feel like from 11 to 12, this is speaking from my first three kids continuously telling me they are like the only kid in the world that doesn't have a cell phone. Right. Yes. <laughs> that is the sob story. And luckily, I've done it three times now. And when the next one comes up, I'm just going to say, listen, like this is this yeah. is the story that yeah. your siblings felt that way too. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry that you're the only person that is of your age that doesn't have a cell phone, but they survived. You will too. But I haven't had this conversation in a long time, so I'm glad we had it. And I'm going to, and I love that you also are throwing in the labels with it mm -hmm. because it takes away from, when somebody feels labeled about it, it takes away from the benefits from having the conversation. Because when yeah. you and I have a conversation, I may, I can learn a lot of great things from you that I'm not thinking about, that I'm not doing, but what, if you threw a label my way, I'd probably shut you down. Mm -hmm. And so then it would take away from the opportunity of getting like tips and tricks. Um, and and frankly, if you feel like you are failing on the technology level, you're talking to the right girl because I have, it hasn't been a strength of mine to keep up with technology and what's going on. And we've had lots of different battles. So I think this is a great conversation to have. Thanks. I I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah, well, it is a relevant conversation to something that is now on my mind because we're getting back into a kid getting a cell phone and what are my responsibilities around it. It has changed a little bit because she now has Chromebooks. So she already has some access to the world at her fingertips through her Chromebook that the others did not, mm -hmm. but a cell phone I think is different. 
And I started having to go back and remember what are some of our family rules with the cell phone and the use. And as I was thinking through it, I and the comment came back into my head that somebody said made about being a helicopter mom. Because one of the rules we had was when you first get your cell phone, this is your phone. But as your parents, we have the right at any moment to look at what's on your phone, Mm -hmm. to see what you've been searching, see who you're texting, see those conversations. And someone thought that that was an invasion of my child's privacy at 12 or 13 years old. And that made me a helicopter mom. So I started thinking back through it. And now, having taught two girls how to drive, I I saw training with a cell phone very similar to teaching them to drive. So they had driver training, and then they took their driver test, and they passed. At that moment, I didn't then say, okay, well, you're good to go. You can go wherever you want, anytime you want, because you have your driver's license. You just go. I'm never going to ride with you. I continued to ride with them. I continued to teach them. Just because they knew the answers from the book and they took a test and the state said you can now drive, I didn't feel as a responsible parent to just allow them to go freely was in their best interest. Mm -hmm. I felt like it was still my responsibility to train and teach. And so I continued to ride with them. I continued to instruct them, continued to set boundaries. You can go in these areas, but don't go on the interstate yet. You can go on this portion of the interstate when they could drive on the interstate, but don't go through Malfunction Junction or don't drive to downtown Columbia. We need to do that together first. And I see training a kid on technology very similar because you have the Chromebooks, you have cell phones, but then you also have social media that plays into that. And I would sit down with McKenna and Kelsey when they got their phones and we would look through text and talk about them and say, would your friend say this to my face? If she were in the house, would she talk like this in front of me? No. Okay, understand, if you write something similar on their phone and their parent sees it, that's still a reflection of you. It it was almost like kids think, no, like I can show up and talk to you one way, but I can talk to my friends differently on texts. And isn't that true in social media? Don't we see that time and time again? People will rant and vent and like vomit their opinion as truth and say horrible things, but would never say that to your face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was... That was this image I had about training with technology but we're just now starting back with the training. We so. are. And it's funny how I had, okay, so when technology was newer mm-hmm. and our kids were had these different opportunities, I had lots of different expectations of the rules that I was going to set. I mean, let's even go back that I was like, no television in my child's bedroom. Like that was something that when they were younger, I was thinking that would always be the case. Now, my children still don't have televisions in their bedroom. Well, that's yeah. not true. Jonah does that he plays video games on. He doesn't watch television on it. He just plays video games on it. Mm -hmm. They still don't because, and they could care less too because the schools issued these devices or they had a phone where they watched Netflix. So all of a sudden, these rules that I thought I was trying to do for their own good, as technology continued and build, then those that was taken out of my hands. Mm -hmm. And that came down with, I also had this, ideal expectation that I felt early on that cell phones weren't going to be in their bedrooms. I, I don't know. It was just something I no, felt like, yeah, I did too. you know, those kind of conversations. I even thought with op- the opposite sex, like that you could get because there's video aspects, because there's mm-hmm. 
you know, with Snapchat or whatever. And that that was just best to not have too much privacy with those because that could become dangerous, which we know that that also is true. There's a whole lot of kids that get themselves in situations that afterwards wish they didn't because of having the privacy aspect and that power in their hands. But I didn't ever think that the school, all their homework would be on devices that they had to have in their bedroom. I mean, they mm-hmm. don't. They can come and do their homework in my kitchen. But if you would come to my house, my kitchen's not a peaceful place for anybody to hang out to do homework. It would only make sense that they do it in their bedroom. So what is funny is that I originally set what I thought were ideal expectations. And I have had to be okay to say, this is a fluid situation. Different social medias change, different avenues of them to connect. Technology continues to change, and I just need to do my best Mm -hmm. to make sure that I'm assisting them, just as you're saying, through it. But I have to also say I'm okay to give up that restriction that I thought I was putting on them because it really doesn't make sense anymore. Yeah. We did the same thing with Snapchat. So we had said you can't have any social media until 14, 13 or 14. See, I forget. (laughs) We need to be consistent. (laughs) But I can't remember. But I think I was 14. But um, Snapchat was new. So it was mostly Instagram and Facebook. And but Snapchat was newer. And um, they were all wanting Snapchat. And that was like. Oh, you know, when it first came out, all the parents were like, oh, no, Snapchat. Well, that we allowed Sally to get Snapchat on my phone so she could snap her sisters. And so she snaps them. So I have a Snapchat account mm-hmm. that I never use. But um, she snaps her sisters back and forth because I realized McKenna and Kelsey were having these text conversations. But... With Sally not being on technology, all she could do was email Kelsey because they're both in the same school district. She couldn't have any of those types of connections with McKenna. And that's how kids connect these days. Mm -hmm. So in order to allow her to have that connection, she does have Snap on my phone. And they sometimes talk about how cute. Like She'll send a little snap of her dance shoe saying (laughs) she's going to dance or something. But that's building that sisterly bond. So if we had been hard and fast on the 13 or 14 rule, we'll say 14. I don't remember what it was. <laughs> that hard and fast rule, she would have missed out on that connection with her sisters. I've had to do the same thing. So we're I'm going to take it off just the side avenue because I do have a boy mm-hmm. that has different interests than what my girls did. And so yeah. video games was another thing that was a – I tried to stick guardrails up, which I felt was best at the time. And so we had the video games in my living room because you don't have a television in your bedroom, right? So, right. and then he's playing these games with his buddies that they scream at each other. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's crazy the way that they <laughs> yell at each other and he's coming, he's behind you, you know, and he's in my living room yelling <laughs> all the time and it drove everybody in the house nuts. Yeah. So I actually went to his sister's. That could Because I had this television rule, yes, right? And I yeah. said, I need to talk to you about this because I'm thinking about putting a television in Jonah's room so he can play video games. And all the, the girls were like, please, yes, <laughs> yes. Get, get him out of the living room. But there was also part of me that didn't want him to play a lot. So keeping it in the living room made it less desirable for him to play because we were annoying to him to be around mm-hmm. all the time. I didn't want him to play a lot. I wanted him to go outside and experience the world and shoot baskets and fish. You know, Mm -hmm. I wanted him to do things like that. But then I had a realization that what the way his friends gather Mm -hmm. is on this video game. Mm -hmm. So from me keeping him away from it as much as I wanted to was actually keeping him from gathering with his peers because that is just, it's the same thing that what you're talking about with Snapchat. So I had to... I could have held hard and fast, but I had I didn't feel that there was value to that for him. Like mm-hmm. being with his buddies on his video game, they're hilarious to listen to, but that was that was okay for him to do that. But I had to I had to kind of like realize to myself it was also okay for me to make to adapt in that situation. Yeah. 
So what are some rules that you set that you said, this was really beneficial for my kid, for our family, that you will definitely continue to do with Jonah and Mara? Because Jonah has a phone now, right? He does. Yeah, so, so Mara is the got only 12. one. Mara's yeah. A, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, the first thing, I, I Mara will be 12 when she gets her phone. I've done that. Yeah. And, I'm, and I feel like that's been a good choice all around. I don't feel the need to adapt that in any mm-hmm. way. So that works. And if she is ever home alone, which she is every so often, she does have an iPad that she can FaceTime Mm -hmm. us with. So she does have a form of communication because we don't have a home phone, but she still has technology there to talk to us with. So that one will keep. I also, in my household, if I say hand over your phone, I don't like give them a warning to go make any adaptations. So that's something. Now, nobody likes handing me their phone. I mean to be totally honest right. um, because it to them it feels like I am stepping into their personal privacy and I get that and mm-hmm. I don't over abuse that because I do also believe that mm-hmm. they have a right to their privacy. I mean, and but it needs to be monitored here and there. And as they get older, I do it less and less. I can't actually remember the last time that I asked Elena, so she's my junior in high school. I wouldn't ask Annalise now. She's an adult. So um, unless I felt there was something that was of danger to her that I needed to somehow monitor. I mean, I would would adapt to that situation. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't remember the last time I've asked Elena to hand over her phone. And I'm not saying to you that if you did it, that that would be wrong for you to do it. I just, in my household, have not been prompted to do it. No, I I mean, I don't remember when I last did it either. And that's why I'm having to remember all the things that we did before because the point of looking at the phone is not to... Keep tabs on them. To keep tabs on Mm -hmm. them or to be your child's conscience. It's to help train them on how to use this tool. Yes. Just like you train them on how to use a car. Mm -hmm. And the goal is... In everything in raising kids, you raise them to not need you, Mm -hmm. to to operate independently of you in this world and become dependent on themselves and make those decisions that are healthy and will benefit their life. And so, I mean, if you're still having to monitor their phone at 18 – That, for me, would be a little concerning because they're about to fly out into the world. And, like, if you are having to stay that much on top of it, and maybe that's why we're having this conversation. Maybe somebody is like, oh, my gosh, I still have to check my kid's phone every night. I don't know if that would be a thing. But, like, that's something you have to let go of and realize I've trained them to be independent and to – go out into the world but no but I but I also so this takes me to another avenue of long-term what our goals are Mm -hmm. and as amazing as I think life 360 is okay Mm -hmm. so that has been a technology piece now I don't have it with my kids but I do I don't have anything against it and Mm -hmm. I just and if I felt the need to put it on Mm -hmm. that I'm even going to give you an example. I don't have, I didn't have PowerSchool on my phone or I didn't even know how to log into PowerSchool, which is a way that in our district, I'm not sure where everybody, if it's used nationally or not, but that you track your child's attendance, their assignments, their grades on Mm -hmm. where they're at. Um, I have, so this is my third child. I now have going through the middle school. He's almost done. Um, and I haven't had power school for all my other children on my phone. This is my personal decision. If I always I felt a little danger in the fact that my children would, if they messed up, they didn't have the ability to fix it before I got that final grade. I mean, that's mm-hmm. how it was when I was younger. Like if I screwed up, I'd be like, okay, I have three weeks until the report cards come out. So then I have an opportunity to fix it. So I wanted to abide by the fact that I wanted my kids to be able to have some figure that out on their own, start navigating. Mm -hmm. I screwed up. What do I do to fix it kind of situation? But last year during the pandemic, 
Jonah was struggling to keep balance on the assignments and, you know, just, I mean, the remote learning was not ideal for him as it wasn't for a lot of students. And that was the very first time that I downloaded PowerSchool onto my phone to be able to check in to see if he's keeping up. Mm-hmm. So, so Life 360, I think it's an amazing opportunity. I mean, it it shows everything. Doesn't even show how fast the students, like somebody's driving. I think it does. A- I think you have to buy a subscription to show okay. everything. So there's there's all these do- different opportunities to be able to stay connected, keep an eye on the situation. Mm-hmm. And I, although I don't have it, I, I see a lot of value in being able to do that. But I had a friend whose son was in college and she was tracking him with everything he did while he was at college. I almost felt like she was a little obsessed with it. Because, Mm -hmm. and one time he was at um, a place where she didn't think he should be. I mean, it was a liquor store. He's in college. And of Mm -hmm. course, like that's, no, that's not ideal for us as parents. But then the anxiety that it caused her, the way that she, you know, wanted to nail him to a wall. I just kept thinking, what in the world? Can you imagine our parents following us around every minute while we were in college? Like, right. And and it's again, I, you know, that I'm a supporter of guardrails, but I thought to myself, what it, what is she doing to herself? And to me, that also encourages even more if the child knows they're being followed, which I'm not sure if he did or not, but to try to be sneaky. If he feels that I'm, he's being watched all the Mm -hmm. time, that adds an avenue of them trying to be manipulative so that they can get around somebody not seeing them. And it just, it it bugged me. But so again, I'm not taking away value. And it just made me sad for her that I was watching the situation and she was struggling to let go of that control because it was so available to her. Mm -hmm. So through, so I've tried to over time, just kind of give them more privacy so I so again I haven't asked Elena for her phone. I don't even I don't even remember the last time. But I do I have asked Jonah periodically mm-hmm. because again he's in that time of starting to navigate mm-hmm. the relationships conversation. He doesn't have social media yet, mm-hmm. although he has a new thing that he does that's Reddit, which I don't even know what it is. So okay, that's so there's a downfall of me too. I don't keep up. On what the latest thing is. Yeah. And, and there are a ton to keep up with. But I, I really do think you and I have some pretty good tips we could pass along to parents. Because we've lived it mm-hmm. on things that worked for us. And maybe some things that didn't work. But you mentioned something. So I want to come back to the tips at the end. You mentioned some your friend whose son was at a liquor store and she didn't like it and she was seeing it and she kind of was losing her mind about it, you know, just obsessing about it. And I think this is a really important talking point to make about how do we respond to what we see on their phone that we don't like or when we get information that we don't like. So these information mm. apps, if you will, are not evil in and of itself. Power school is not evil. No. It's a great assessment tool. Yes. Life 360 is not evil. Nope. It's a great assessment tool. Mm-hmm. Your eyes looking at your child's texts or their social media and what their friends are posting, that's not bad. It is just information. So... I think it's important that we evaluate how we deal with the information that we're given. Whenever we see something that our kids have searched that we think, hmm, need to address that, or the way that they're talking, for some reason, it's so cool for teenage for middle schoolers to start start cursing. Like now I'm grown up, I can say bad words. And you think, Okay, you don't even know how to cuss, right? You're not even using it, right? (laughs) But, um, like, that is a thing, like, how you communicate. How do you respond and not react? And I'm intentionally saying respond because I think 
we need to have the mindset, I need to respond to this, not react to this. Because we can be reactionary and that will damage relationships and not help us to truly reach our goal, which is to support our kids and help them to learn and grow through these things. Sometimes we feel it as a slight on us as parents. So when you see something on your child's phone that you don't like, what do you do? Well, ideally asking questions is your is my best way to go. Can I say that I've never been like, are you kidding me? You know, mm-hmm. I probably have. But my... I always know that asking questions of, and in not an interrogation form, right. but truly trying to gather information on how somebody's feeling, how somebody's doing, why are, how does something make them feel when they see it? Mm-hmm. Asking them questions so that they're not feeling immediately like they have to defend themselves. Yeah. And even questions sometimes they, that's that's a little scary to be asking questions if, if something is found on a device that maybe they know should not be there. So of course the question is already scary for them, but by asking questions and not pointing fingers is, I try try to actually do that all the time with my kids because I always think to myself, that that big moment, the big moment of mom, I'm pregnant, or the big moment that I did something really bad. I wrecked the car. I wrecked the car. Yeah. I, you know, whatever that moment is, I want to be, I don't want to react in a way that it permanently makes them feel damaged or little. I mean, mm-hmm. I, and I feel like we, so training ourselves for those big moments, these little moments of we're finding these little things is really a training for those big moments. And no yeah. matter, and that big moment is going to come. I don't know what it's going to look like. I mean, it could it could go all different directions and I don't know when it's going to happen. But there's going to be a big moment that I'm, all this training is going to come and hopefully I'm going to react in a way that we will be able to walk forward in that situation together. Mm-hmm. But asking questions of what do you, what do you think that this person's trying to say here? Why do you think you said that? Mm-hmm. You know, how we're, you know, I feel like asking questions is the key to keeping conversation open and not having them shut down, defend themselves, or come back and def- throw things back your way as if, you know, you're in my business, you don't belong in my business, and coming that way. Because frankly, just asking some questions to try to figure out where they're at and where their heart's at is the best way to keep conversation moving. Yeah. Because, like you said, I love what you said about, It's training us to respond in the little things. It's training us to respond in the big things. But our response in the little things is building that relationship. Mm -hmm. So are we communicating to our kids that this is the standard you have to live by and anytime you step out of it, then man, we're going to attack you or be mad at you or are we going to offer you grace and explain to you why this is concerning to us. Why do I not want you driving 65 down Amex Ferry Road? That's a road that we both live off of. It's super windy. A couple of years ago, the DOT decided to pave it three times in the summer. Like that's all they did was just keep paving this road. So it was super built up, really high. And they had these huge ditches on the side and it's curvy and people fly down that road. Yes. And after they paved it, before they realized that there was a problem with what they had made, we were seeing cars in the ditches all the time. Mm-hmm. And um, so on our, we do have Life 360. Mm-hmm. It's, we say it's my husband's favorite game because <laughs> none of us look at Life 360 very often. But he was always Life 360-ing us. But it was super helpful to me when they were learning to drive because I would think, oh, they should have been here about 20 minutes ago. I don't want to call them because they're new drivers. I don't want to distract them. But I hope they haven't gotten lost. I hope they're not on the side of the road, stuck in that ditch in Amex Ferry somewhere. And so I could look on that app and say, okay, they're on their way. They're coming. And it does have a lot of features that we don't have because we don't pay for it. But 
it will tell you the top speed for that trip. Okay. But after that, it doesn't. And there were times that we would have to say, hey, I saw on the app that you were going 62 and the speed limit's 50 on this road and say, we just want you to be aware of your speed. You're, I mean, I've had plenty of speeding tickets. Your dad drives very fast too. It's easy to have a heavy foot. We're not mad at you, but we just want you to see that this is a difficult, this could be a difficult thing to correct if a car comes over into your lane. Well, one of the girls, it wasn't two weeks after that conversation, came walking through the door, shaking, crying. And um, for whatever, I think that, you know, maybe the Lord just put it in her head that day, I need to slow down. And she was coming up to one of those curves and a car had crossed the yellow line because they were going too fast around that curve. And she had to swerve off the road. And she came in and said, if I had been going any faster, I would have, it would have been bad. And she was shaken and she was scared. But that's why we had that conversation. It wasn't to belittle her and beat her up for driving faster than she was supposed to. And we'd already told her time and time, slow down. It was for her safety. So what, but what I'm hearing you say is that you, you use it for teaching moments for yes. them. Yeah. And I think that no matter, I think whenever we find something that we need, there's an important conversation that needs to be had about it. Also taking some time to step away for a second, especially if we're feeling yes. seriously reactionary. Like if we are fired up, then we need to step away for a second because and maybe days. Mm -hmm. You might not just step away for a moment. You might need to step away for days. Because ultimately with my kids, they are going to be out of my, I mean, I already have one off mm -hmm. to college. We're soon, we'll be sending the second and then the other two, wh whether they go to college or out into life, I don't intend them to be living with me forever. So I have, these are all teaching moments. Mm -hmm. So by taking time to step away so that you can realize that your intention is that they come out of it, if there's a punishment that needs to be issued because of a certain behavior, so be it. I mean, that I'm not saying don't, if they break a rule, then they in your household have a responsibility to pay the price. I mean, whatever whatever that mm -hmm. looks like. And, and But yet, ultimately, you still want them to, have a learning moment out of it because what your goal is is they don't repeat a behavior that wasn't serving them well and eventually they're going to be out of your house and you, you're you not going to have those teaching moments with them. So I, I think the big takeaway from these apps, from these tools that we have for getting information is use it as a tool mm -hmm. and see it as, okay, I've been given some insight here have some discretion on how I need to um, internalize it, how I need to think about it, and how I need to address it. And maybe you don't address it. You mm -hmm. don't have to address every single thing you see. Right. If you address every single thing you see, then they, they're they going to feel like they're walking on eggshells all the time. And plus, they may just mute you. Yes. You know what I mean? Absolutely. They'll write you off. They'll sit. Yes. They'll listen but they're not internalizing the conversation you're having with them and then they're out the door and they could care less what you just said. Right. So you you really want to see it as a great tool, a great feature to help you to train up your kids, to help them navigate life and navigate their way through all these interesting things they have to navigate through. And so identifying what do you want to respond to and then how do I present this information? Mm -hmm. You may need to talk to somebody else first before you have a conversation with your kid. Mm -hmm. And don't talk to, if, if your spouse gets really worked up very easily, be mindful of that. And if you present that information, know that they're going to get you jacked up more, you know, or... A friend who, if they're if they're easy to say, oh, what I would do is rah, bring down the hammer. Maybe you need to talk to another friend too. But I'm not saying don't talk to that friend. I'm just saying like 
talk with both sides so that you can really meet that child's needs. Um, and if it's something big, I mean, I'm, I'm going to go if, if we find, if I found porn on Jonah's phone or device. So to me, that's, we, we really need to have an important conversation, but I really need to pray before I have that conversation with him. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a chance that our kids are going to think that we are overreacting or just because the modern world is telling them something different than we're telling them. Mm -hmm. I finally told Jonah that he was not allowed to call me a Karen anymore. Like that way <laughs> that came off the table yeah, because absolutely. that's like that common statement right now of, I don't care if he likes what I feel is right. And I put the boundaries up for him. I, I could care less if I don't want to be his friend right now. That's, that's not my place right now in his life is to be somebody that loves on him, guides him. And so therefore that means that sometimes he's not always going to like the things I say. But I think that's another thing that we, as parents, we're, we're, the world muddies it up as if our kids are supposed to like, like us or like all the decisions we make about their life. And that it's, it, that's come down. Yes, everybody has a cell phone except my daughter until she's 12. And in my heart, I want to please her. So of course I would be like, okay, we'll go ahead and give you. But in, in my spirit, I know that's not the right thing for her. And we need to make sure that we are taking that, taking the guidance the Lord has given us of feeling confident that we are intentionally put on this world to be our ch child's parent. Mm -hmm. Like, we, it's not to please the world. It's to guide these little people up and raise them up so that they can go on and be amazing adults. And so we can't, we're going to disappoint them. And so he may now call me a Karen in his head, but it, it doesn't come out of his mouth anymore. But that was something I yeah. had to deal with is the fact that he's not always going to like it and that's okay. And, and you have to make those hard decisions. And when you're settled that uh, I'm doing this because I love you and this is the best thing for you. And you can't see it right now. It's just like when they were really little and they wanted to eat all the candy they got after Halloween. Like They thought this would be the best thing to eat all this candy. And you say, no, your stomach's going to hurt. You're going to feel terrible. They can't see that. Mm -hmm. And then they eat way more candy than they should. And then they're crying because they have a tummy ache, you know? Well, it's the same way now. Like, they know it. They think they want, but they just don't have the foresight to see how that really plays out in their life. But you can still be loving and respectful and still be firm. Mm -hmm. And that's an intentional choice because our kids know how to push your buttons. Mm -hmm. You know, they've lived with you and know how to, how to make that happen. But we do have some really great tips that I will definitely still do with my kids especially, at, or with Sally, especially with the introduction to the cell phone. So we did have the rule, you could not have your phone in your room at night when they first got it. And it was more that they would just stay on it yes. and then be up super late mm -hmm. and not get the sleep that they needed. Also, we know how bad it is to have that screen light in your eyes right before you go to bed. So we have a table in the hall that that's where the phone would charge at night. Now, as they got older and we're setting their own alarms and it, your phone becomes an integral part of who you are, mm -hmm. but, and how you function through life. But when they first got it, setting that boundary of no, you put your phone away so that they would go to sleep at night and not stay up playing games. I thought that was a fantastic rule. I and we'll too. continue to do that. Also, sleepovers. At a certain time, at 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock, the kids that are sleeping over don't have their phones anymore. They sit on that same table. They have access to their phone. If they ever needed to message their parent like, oh, I'm anxious or I'm not feeling well, I want to talk with my mom, it's there. I'm not keeping communication away from them. But 
12, 13 year old girls can get silly and I don't want them making bad decisions in my house that other parents would be like, oh, I can't believe my kids did this over there. Or years down the road, they're like, oh man, this was such a bad decision. Like, No, I think it's great that you do that. Mm -hmm. So is there, do you still do that with Kelsey? Has friends sleep over now? Or yeah. is that that she's so there, a senior, right? Yeah. So there's a so that was through that like middle school time the middle that that was school. okay. No, I think that's a great um, tip. I'm trying to remember. I think we even their freshman year in high school, we did that because freshman year in high school senior boys are always trying to get the attention of freshman girls. It seems like. <laughs> And we well, have really cute girls too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but and I think just in general, mm-hmm. that's always been kind of a thing. And so, okay, we don't want any nonsense happening here mm-hmm. at the house. So we would tell them, you can have your phone, and it would be a later time for them, but always tried to f- find really fun activities for them to do so that they didn't want to be on their phones either. And um, that is a rule that I'm really glad we stuck to, especially through their freshman year, Mm -hmm. because I do know of situations where things didn't go so well. But um, yeah, now you have to give them, again, some freedoms and then talk with your kids about what other people are doing with... You have to be mindful of how other people are handling social media Mm -hmm. as you get older because it's very easy for somebody to take a picture of you and put it online that you would not want to be taken. So I want to I want to stop for a second because there may be another parent that's listening to this right now that would be like what you just said, which I think is a great tip. And again, the great thing is when we have these conversations, you can say that that's a great idea or say, I don't think that'll work for me. But one Mm -hmm. of the things I feel like it would be an objection to that is that somebody would say, well, if a parent texts their child, they wouldn't get that text. And sometimes there is that going back and forth. And, And one thing I do know is that you do have conversations with the parents ahead of time, Mm -hmm. letting them know that there's a place after a certain time the device is going to be put. So this is not like, you're not putting the parent in an uncomfortable panic because they can't get a hold of their child or whatever. You have those conversations ahead of time. Right. Now, the table I'm talking about is right where they, there's a table in the hallway and there's the room they all sleep in and it's, all the rooms are upstairs. Mm -hmm. So the phone is there. They never not have access to their parents. And if they have their phone on, plugged in and they get a text, it'll pop up. Like Mm -hmm. you'll see that you have a text. Also, the parents can text me and say, right. tell so-and-so to check her phone. No doubt. I just wanted to put it out there yeah. because there, you know how yeah. like objections start creating sometimes in our head on why something like I'm going to prove you wrong. And yeah. Uh, and so that is a practice that you have in your household, which I think is fantastic. And you also make sure that you're clear to the parents that this is this is something that we do in this house in order to make sure that those girls are also interacting with each other. Yes. In the evenings yeah. instead of interacting with their phones. I mean, you're bringing them together in community and then when everybody's just on their device and not connecting and Well, and then they may in- innocently decide to message another friend who wasn't over at the sleepover. Now this kid's feeling left out. Why wasn't Mm -hmm. I invited? And then like drama starts. So now I do know that kids get anxious over their phones, Mm -hmm. over not having their phones. We had a small group here that met after school. And during small group Bible study, we had a basket and said, okay, everybody put your phone in the basket. And the basket just sat up to the side just so that they could be there for 45 minutes while we went over and engaged and we would be splitting up into groups and coming back together. There was one girl who was so anxious that she did not have her phone in her hand that she stopped coming. Mm. And, but that was, that was the rule because Mm -hmm. what happened was the same girl would be on her phone the entire time. Mm -hmm. 
talking to other people, if I just said, okay, you can hold it, but just don't play games on it. Don't be posting on it. Don't be snapping on it. She could not stop, truly. And um, I talked to her mom about it. I was like, listen, there are almost 20 other girls here and it's only 45 minutes. And I really need her attention, but I can't let her be doing this while the other girls are not. And she was like, this is a real big problem we're having. She has anxiety if her phone is not in her hand or if she hears a notification go off and she can't immediately get it. Like they were having that issue at dinner. So her mom had set the rule, no phones at the dinner table, which is a rule we have too. But she would keep it to where she could see it or hear it if she could not respond immediately. Okay, the social dilemma yes. totally talked about how we're trained for that. Yes. So unfortunately, that was a decision that they made not to come back, which was unfortunate for that, for them, but it benefited the group. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, it, it, it just did because it was a distraction that wasn't there anymore. But um, let me say what benefited the group was it benefited the group to not have their phones. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, that is a rule that that we'll stick to as well. And it's interesting if I tell other people that rule, they're like, yeah, we have a similar rule as well. I think sometimes we're afraid to say this is where we are in our household. This is what we think. But if we ha- open that conversation, usually people do not object. If they're not, they're, they don't object over it. Okay, so one of the okay. tips I have, and in my mind, I feel like I don't have any good tips, but there are some different restrictions that we have set up early on that I'm glad we did. And one of them is when our child gets their first phone, I set up the phone so that there's a searching restriction as far as maturity level restriction. I I don't even know how the phone like sets it. I don't know if it's like over 14 or mature. And so we set up that restriction and there's times it becomes inconvenient because there's weird things that are restricted. So Jonah will come to me and say, I can't even search out, you know, funny dog pictures or whatever. I don't know. He'll put some, he'll, he'll type something in and it'll say that the search is restricted. And it's, Mm -hmm. It's not something that should be restricted or that, but obviously there's something down that avenue or lane that there was a reason a restriction was put on that. So when they get their first phone, I set up the phone and I go ahead and set that age search restriction on. Sometimes it comes back and he's frustrated with me about it because there's certain topics that can't be searched, but I'll just say, we'll use my phone then, or, you know, use my laptop to, to search that out. And I guess I kind of say like, suck it up buttercup in the way of, for the most part, this cuts off inappropriate things that could come up. And I certainly just don't want you to get lost in an avenue of that. So you did that when you set up the phone? Yes. That was like, that was during that beginning time of setting up the phone. I was able to put those restrictions on and it was with a password that I knew. He didn't know that particular password to... So that's change up good. those settings. Yeah, yeah that's it's so it's good in the settings. Know. And I'm wondering if because it ha- it has been a while since we did this, and I'm wondering if I did it before on their first phones because that seems like something that somebody would have told me was a good thing to do, and I would have done it. But yeah, I didn't even think about that being in the settings. Yeah, that's a great tip, and I think that. Android has a lot better features to assist parents in setting up phones for their success than what Apple does. Apple Mm -hmm. values the privacy of the user more, like they're very big on that. So there's less features. Um, If you're an Android user, like I have a friend that when they first had an Android phone and they got the Android phone for their child, then they were able to actually access at any time what their child was looking at. Like they were able to see it from their phone. There was Mm -hmm. a connection between their phones, which I thought was pretty great. Like, you know, when you have a young person 
learning how to use a phone that you can easily, you don't have to take their phone and then figure out how to unlock it, how to navigate it, mm-hmm. where's their stuff at. It was literally, she could screen, see the screen of what her child was looking at, but I don't, that's not available on Apple phones, which Apple products is what my family has always used. Okay. I would love to hear what tools people are using. Because I am just getting back into this world, and I don't know those tools. I don't. I don't know those apps anymore. So, anybody out there who says this is what you need, shoot that over to us because we want to hear it. Help a mama out. Yes, I need help. But you, I wanted to bring up this conversation because when our older girls. When they first got the phones, there was no thought around this device right here is as addictive as heroin. Right. No, we had no clue. No. And that this device is training your brain to function a certain way chemically. Like there are chemical changes happening in your body because of the way that device behaves. And that device learns those behaviors and then encourages you to behave in a certain way. That was not a that was not a thought at all. And I don't even know if thinking back to that time, I don't know that it was really happening at that time because they were only texting and they weren't allowed to use social media early on. So I don't know how much the phone was directing behaviors. And all this was learned through the social dilemma. Right. So I think that some of those things actually have come of age as the people that set up social media. It's the marketing buying power has Mm -hmm. continued to grow through social media And those, they've been able to create the formulas to keep us viewing. That is always the goal of the device is to keep us viewing. Mm -hmm. So when we really think about that, we put this tool in our child's hand and their goal of the device is to keep their eyes on that device. Yeah. I told Didi we took a little break and we actually decided to come back and, and talk a little more because... I'm, there's a lot of areas even speaking to you today about this that I see that I'm not doing a good job with. I, my son is young enough that I need to keep those guardrails tighter. And in in the evening I say, get off your phone. But remember the device that he has in his hand, the goal of the device is to keep his eyes on there. So I'm battling. So I may say, get off your phone. And then I go to bed but I don't know when he gets off his phone. I'm I'm making the assumption in my mind that he's stronger than the algorithms that are attempting to keep his eyes on it. Yes. So um, he's... And we know that's a struggle for us as well. Mom and dad, right? Like Mm -hmm. grandma and grandpa, like we are all falling prey to it because that's the goal of the device. Again, we're not here to... I mean, anything that... I've brought up today as far as a app that is used, a device that's used, they all can be really positive tools. Yes. That can be used in a very negative, that can negatively impact our life and our thought process. Yeah. As with the phone itself, Mm -hmm. like it is a powerful tool that we could use to benefit our life or it could ruin your life. I I know I mentioned that one of our rules first off was they could not have their phones when they went to bed to, because we know how bad that is for, to have that, the light in your eyes, but also they're going to stay up and play on it. Well, I can't just keep it away from them until they're 18 and then expect them to go off and to not stay on their phone all night. So there was a time when they got their phone, they could have their phones all night. And I knew they were staying up, playing games, texting friends, and they were tired the next morning mm-hmm. and they were struggling. 
And so then we had to have that conversation of how late are you staying on your phone? A lot of times they didn't even know. But you could kind of see, like, if they were texting somebody. We did put a rule not to text after a certain time. But um, I said, okay, well, be aware. Just tonight, if, if you feel like you need to play a game to go to sleep or whatever, or watch something, just be aware of what time you turned your phone off. And they were surprised mm-hmm. by how much time would pass. And it's just about teaching them to use this responsibly. And now we know how addictive it is, how when you hear that ding, chemicals are released in your brain. Elena actually removes, if she knows she has a like busy week ahead, mm-hmm. she's pretty self-aware when it comes to, I have a lot to do and this is not good for me. So she takes things off her phone. Like she deletes apps and deletes different things during the time that she knows that she has to focus. She does end up putting it back on once she, you know, she mm-hmm. gets through that busy week or she'll put it back on. But that's, she for, she knows that she can't just say, I'm not going to look at it. Right. So she actually needs it removed yeah. so that she can do what she needs to do. And then she puts it back on there. And I... I think it's great that she, that wasn't something that I suggested to her. That was something in her, on her own that she determined because she sees how drawn she is Mm -hmm. to continuing to look at the screen. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's what they're made to do. Mm -hmm. And the designers of it, they did not set out in order to create this monster, but it's just in the nature of how it was created is what's evolved. Like nothing evil was intended. It doesn't sound like. It's just the nature of the invention. Well, now we know it. Now we know it's stronger. And so how do we help our kiddos and ourselves to navigate this? Because we we've talked about when you see something you feel like you need to react. It's what it's driving you to do. It's driving you to react. So how do you control yourself, take a step back, and then learn how to respond? And so that's why, too, I think it's so important that we think through this and have this conversation around it so that other people who are trying to influence our thoughts saying, you should never look at your kid's phone that's an invasion of their privacy. And other people are like, you need to be monitoring their phone until they have their own kids who are middle schoolers and they're monitoring their phone. Like, have that conversation around where do you fall on that? What are your house rules? Think through that so you can stand firm against it because people are very vocal about their own opinions these days. Mm Mm-hmm. And what they think is right and what they think is wrong. And you have to be settled in what you believe and, and why to, you believe it. And we need to check ourselves too. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're, we, it's really ridiculous for us to tell our students that that's an addictive device and you need to put it away and you don't even realize it's the way it's manipulating your brain. And then we have our phones in our hands all the time. Yes. I mean, we're, we're setting the tone for the house. So we should be. The leader, mm-hmm. which means the example to what our if 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 we as parents have our phones at the dinner table or we hear a buzz ag- up against the room and we have to chase every notification, mm-hmm. then certainly we're that's what they see. I mean, I have so having the watch on my hand that buzzes with text messages and emails. That's that's a whole. I've had to really gain some self control with that, and it's not that I never look at it. But I have determined that if I'm in a conversation with you that is that I need to be invested in, if we're doing a podcast right now and my wrist is buzzing, or even if you and I are just talking and I need to be invested in that conversation, it doesn't matter how much my wrist buzzes. But that had to be such an intentional decision on my part, and I still screw it up. Mm-hmm. But yet it had to become super intentional because um, I don't want this watch to roll my thoughts. I don't want my phone to rule my thoughts, but um, we have to help them navigate through that because they, they're they being trained. The device is trying to train them 
or the social media is trying to train them. Mm -hmm. So we, we do have to step in for that. So interesting you said that because I actually stopped wearing my watch because of that. Mm. I only I only wear it when I work out now or if I want to track my sleep that night, but I started noticing this. Yes. And I'm having a conversation with somebody and I'm looking at my watch, which is giving them the impression that I'm ready to get out of here because I'm checking my watch or you don't matter to me. I have something more important than you mm -hmm. to put my attention to. Yeah. And again, that's not necessarily true. It's just how no, it's now the watch true. is training us. To, yeah. Yes. Because something's buzzing mm -hmm. and so you look. But yeah, being aware of that is so important. So anyway, that's why I wanted to bring up this conversation and kind of stop the stigma around it, around having the conversation. I think people are so afraid of how they're going to show up, so afraid they're going to make their kids mad and understand they might get mad, especially if it's been really lax and you're seeing some negative fruits of it in their life. When you bring it up, understand they're like they're really attached to this device. Mm -hmm. You know, like the girl I talked about, like she was so attached to it. Her anxiety was real. It was real. Mm -hmm. And having that conversation with the mom too, not in a judgmental way at all. The mom appreciated that conversation. And she was able to, to share in an open space this is the struggle I'm having at home too. And that was, those are the types of conversations we need to have instead of pretending like everything is fine. Not just with this, but just in life. Uh, I'm still friends with them and care about her, but it just was a situation that had to be addressed. And it was good that we could have that conversation. Mm -hmm. So I think to wrap it up, one, when we get information, as we're trying to teach our kids, make sure we respond and not react. Because even if they have a friend that messages them or texts them something that seems ugly, we've got to make sure that we keep in mind this is their friend. Mm -hmm. And um, the way that we respond is going to influence what they continue to tell us, you know. Um, and then evaluate what works for your family, what rules you want to have. Just like when a kid gets a license, they can drive anywhere, anytime, legally. But then within your own house, you have rules for their benefit, for where they are, and evaluating that. And, oh, man, we have got to stop dropping the labels. I mean, we have got to start dropping the labels that we put on other people. And understand people really are just trying to do the best by their children. Which also means allow yourself to be flexible. If you feel yes. that you have set a standard or a rule that is not working, it mm -hmm. doesn't work or it doesn't make sense anymore, or you've been able to think it through, you can change your mind. I yeah. mean... And I think that the, that is a huge benefit. Sometimes people feel like they don't want their child to see that we're willing to maybe bend in an area that we've set a standard in. But once we learn that this standard isn't ideal, mm -hmm. like it's to our children's benefit for them to also see that, that if something's not working, then you can adjust. Yeah. So if we do that in our parenting, like they can see that it's, they have the ability to do that in life. Mm -hmm. And explaining to them mm -hmm. why you're making that adjustment and why you have this new insight about it or this new opinion about it. So it's difficult. It's forever changing too. I mean, what, who knows how things are going to look once Mara and Sally get into high school. I mean, yeah. look at how much has changed since our older kids started out maneuvering through mm -hmm. this and it's going to keep changing we need to keep talking about it. I mean, even through this conversation, yeah. I realize how many things I have dropped the ball and learning on, you know, different apps out there, different ways that kids are communicating. 
ways that they're able to hide communication. That's another thing that is out there. And I'm not on top of it. And I'm feeling very convicted during this conversation because that's, although I want my children to learn how to navigate their life, it's still, we are their teachers in how they move forward. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So good conversation. I don't, it's going to be a couple of months until we're back into it, but I think the worst thing we could do is not start talking about it and not start thinking about it because um, you don't want to put your head in the sand, which is really easy to do. But no, you just and the can't. phone is a very powerful tool. It is. Mm-hmm. And it's very addictive. If you haven't watched The Social Dilemma on Netflix, on Netflix, people kept saying it was scary. It was not a scary thing to me. It was just eye-opening to me. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I watched it. I appreciated the information that they provided because um, I felt like it empowered me to make some decisions. I want my my family to watch it. But um, yeah, it is a powerful tool that we can use to benefit our life or to detract from our life. So I agree. Yeah. If you would like to learn more about our coaching business and the different things Nicole and I have going on, please go visit our website at www.liveyourdesign.life. And if you like this podcast or if you have a question that you would like us to discuss, subscribe, drop us a comment, give us a thumbs up and um, message us. We want to hear from you because We have conversations around things that we feel are relevant in our lives, but we want to hear what you're going through, what your questions are, what you want the top taken off so that we can discuss out loud and bring women together in that way. I hope you have a very blessed week. Goodbye.